because they had a, are you ready kids, a drill instructor. Okay, let's try that again. They don't panic because they had a drill instructor. Thank you. You see, what happens is that they go to this thing they call basic training. And in training, they take that soldier, that police officer, that firefighter through many different scenarios. That is little stories that they take them through to say, this is what could be happening. And so how are you going to deal with it? For instance, there's an emergency situation. You're a, 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 a soldier and your gun jams. What are you going to do? You better know how to take that gun apart, clear that jam, clean out whatever needs to be cleaned out, put it back together, and get back in the fight. In fact, I can tell you right now that they will take you in basic training so many times through that scenario that you will be able to rebuild your M16 or your P4 or whatever you happen to be issued. You'll be able to rebuild that thing in the dark with your eyes closed. Well, when am I going to need to do that, said the drill instructor. Oh, my goodness. All right, what happens if you're in a foxhole somewhere, the enemy's right over there and your gun jams? It's the middle of the night. Are you going to say, hold it, everybody, I need to fix my gun? You better know how to tear that thing down, clear it, clean it, get it back together and get back in the fight because that's part of the scenario. That's one of the things you need to know could be happening. Now, do they give those warnings in basic training? Does your drill instructor better? Does he tell you that to frighten you? Does he tell you that to scare you, to bring panic? No, he tells you those things to prepare you. I mean, when a firefighter comes up and he puts his hand on a door in a burning building and that door is hot to the touch, he knows you don't open that door because there's fire on the other side of that door. And if you open that door, that Flame is going to come out of there and consume you, okay? Is that to scare that firefighter? No, it's to prepare him for warning or to warn him for emergencies that might come up. So as we begin this morning and kind of begin at the exact same place, if you would open your Bibles to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter number 2. We're actually going to begin chapter 2 today, but we're going to do a little bit of review because I want to start this morning very quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time preaching this morning because I do want to get to the Lord's Supper but I need you to hear from the apostle this morning a timely warning because friends and neighbors, I probably don't have to tell you this, but I, I, I titled the message, The Contaminated Culture, because we live in a contaminated culture. It's contaminated by sin, it's contaminated by rebellion, it's contaminated by so many different things that will pull you away from God, will pull you away from righteousness, will pull you away from purity, and it is out there. Am I telling you that to frighten you? No, I am God's drill instructor. Okay, it's getting better, all right. I'm God's drill instructor to say to you, that's coming, get ready for it. Get ready for it, all right? So as we look at this, we're going to see a timely warning. A, a timely warning is a warning ahead of time. How many of you like to see the detour sign after you're already in traffic, stopped, or moving two miles an hour? That is not a blessing when you see the detour sign after you're stuck in traffic. I want to see that beforehand. Or if you see the sign that says, do not feed the bears, and you immediately think, what bears? I didn't know there were bears around here. You know, I don't want to see the sign then. I want to see that at the gate, right? So what is the timely warning that our friend Peter wants to give us? He's going to tell us about people who want to falsify God's word. We talked last week about the more sure word, that God's word is more sure than even a voice from heaven, that God's word that we have in front of us is even more sure than some miraculous uh, revelation that we might get. This more sure, if there were people out there who would falsify the more sure word. If there were those people who would come and say, thus saith the Lord, and then lie to you, would it be important for you to know about that in advance? I think that that's something that might be a scenario. That, in fact, I know that's a scenario you're going to encounter, and that's exactly the scenario that our spiritual drill instructor, thank you, is about to present to us here. Chapter, in fact, let's begin back over in chapter 19 just a little bit. I want to remind you of what he said in verse 19 of chapter 1. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention 
as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now stop right there and look up at hear me just a second. You understand, I hope, that these things that say chapter 2 or the little heading in there, those are not in Scripture. Those are there to help us find it in Scripture. So that when I say chapter 2, you say, oh, there it is, there's the 2. Must be where we're going to start. When Simon Peter wrote this, he didn't put the big number 2 there, okay? So you need to skip over that this morning, and I want to read it that way and let you hear what he's trying to say and what he is trying to warn you about, and here is timely warning. Verse 21 again of chapter 1. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God, but false prophets also arose among the people just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And we see here, he's beginning the first thing, and if you have your outline in front of you, you want to write it in, it's a, a timely warning. He's got a timely warning for us. Now, is that intended to frighten us? No. Is it intended to make us panic and worry and be all upset? It's intended to scare us? No. It's intended to make you aware of the threat so that you'll know how to deal with it. Had a friend that was a Marine, and he would, he'd encounter a, a situation. I said, what are you going to do about that? He said, I'm going to deal with it. You know what? That's what they teach Marines. You're, in, you're the guy that found the problem. You deal with it. And so God is showing us here, here is a scenario you might encounter every basic training scenario whether it's police officers, firefighters, even mailmen. I used to be a basic trainer for mailmen, and there's problems you're going to meet. Can you say dogs? Hello. <clears throat> they don't give it to you so you'll be afraid. They give it to you so you'll know how to deal with it, how to counter it, how to practice what to do. So what are the threats here? What are the, what are the false teachers? If we see this first thing that they mention there in verse number 1. He, he mentions these false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Here it is, even denying the master who bought them. The first thing that you'll see that they're going to talk about and that Peter is warning us about is that there are going to be people who will deny Jesus. They'll still use his name. They'll stu still use the nomenclature of the gospel oftentimes, but they will deny who Jesus really was. There, at the time when Peter was already preaching here, there were already those people who were saying that Jesus was not really God, that he was just a great man. And you'll hear that even in, in places today. They say, well, now we believe Jesus was a great teacher, but if, was, we don't really think he was deity. We don't think he was really God. Well, people, if Jesus claimed what he claimed and said what he said, but he wasn't really God, then he's a liar. Because he said, I and my Father are one. And we know Jesus does not lie, but these people were already saying this, that Jesus wasn't really God. And then right on the other hand, there were those that were saying, well, Jesus wasn't really a man. They would say, well, he became God at the cross, or, or he was just God in disguise, or, or he wasn't really a man. Only, listen to me, only a... <laughs> This is one of those big words that you're going to throw out there. Theanthropos, that is the God-man. He was both God and man, fully God and fully man. Only he could pay our sin debt. Only he could die in our place. He had to be very God, a very God. He had to be very man, a very man. Any less, and you are still in your sins. Any less, and you're not saved. And yet, amazingly, some prophets then, and even some seminary professors now will deny the very Christ who makes them a Christian. And so that's one of the things. Get ready for that scenario. Be prepared for it. But the second one is, look at verse number 2. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned. You know, the modern problem of acting all spiritual and yet being a slave to some sin of the flesh, it's not a modern problem. It's been with us since the very beginning the first century church had already become infected with teachers who were saying, hey, we'll, we'll just let God's grace mean that I can do whatever I want. I mean, after all, we're under grace, right? So anything goes, right? As long as it makes you happy, just do it. As long as it looks good, eat it. If it smells good, moving right along. It is still a, a, a timely warning, though. The Scripture tells us flee youthful lusts, doesn't it? Is that still a timely warning? 
said it almost 2,000 years ago, still a timely warning. You say, well, I'm 73. Still a timely warning to flee youthful lust. Amen? They're all around us still. There's still a timely warning that says, hate, hate even the garment that is stained by sin. It's still a timely warning when the Bible tells us that know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, you're bought with a price. Those things are still timely warnings. But because of popular teachers, because of people who have sold a lot of books, they just don't seem to take sin very seriously. And here in verse 2 it says they're following their sensuality. It makes my body feel good. It makes my heart happy. And because of the church's willingness to accept those things, because we're beating our feet down there to the bookstore and buying their books, you know what's happening? The truth of God is being maligned. Because we're not pointing it out. I wonder how many late night talk show hosts, how many jokes have been leveled against God because God's people were willing to say, oh, well, you know, that's just how people are. How many late night talk, how many situation comedy have you seen where God and his church are maligned? Mostly because of what Christian, so-called Christian people are doing. But let me quickly go on to the next one, verse number three. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. Note, please, that it says they will exploit you. Now, that Greek word there is, I probably will pronounce it incorrectly, but it's imporomovii. Imporomovii. That they will exploit you. Okay? You hear another word in there that maybe we've used in our lifetime, the emporium. You ever, I mean, some of the younger ones never heard that word, but that was what they used to call Walmart. It was an emporium. Or it was a, a, an ice cream emporium. It was a place where you put merchandise out there, and you wanted to make it look as good as it possibly could because you wanted to get them in the door. Friend, that's why you go down to IHOP, and they've got this 14-foot tall stack of pancakes, and it's got steaming, I mean, it's just beautiful, and you go in there, and give me some of them pancakes, and they give you some silver dollar size things about like this. Now, I'm not picking on IHOP, I don't know, they may have the greatest pancakes in the world. If you think so, you're fine, that's cool. But what they're doing is they're putting you, pulling you in, making merchandise to pull you in to exploit you. And there's two popular ways that teachers, these false teachers he's talking about, can still do that today. And remembering, these are false prophets, okay? The first one is that there are people all over our country and all over our world who seem to have some fresh revelation from God. And I mean by that, that they're having, they, they, it's like, oh, I'm having a heavy revy. God is talking. Now, I'm not making fun. Well, yeah, I am a little. But there are those people who will tell you that they're receiving from God something on an equal basis with this book. Let me tell you something. If somebody will tell you that, they will lie to you about other important things too. Now, I hear from God in direction and in helping me and in, in, in conviction of sin pretty much on a regular basis. But you know how I do it? I hear it from this word. I hear it from my friends and my neighbors. I hear it from my wife. <clears throat> but these folks, they want to get a following after themselves, so they have some fresh new word from God. Maybe it's a new command. Maybe it's a new warning. Maybe it's a new, y'all need to send me money. Whatever that command happens to be, it focuses in on themselves, and they are gaining a following for themselves. But, see, the problem with them is that like the Pied Piper of Hamlin, you remember he had to continue children to play the pipe? so that the, the rats would follow him out of the city. You remember that story? Some of you, that, anyway. If he stopped playing the pipe, the people or the things that were following him would all go back into the city. And so these false prophets who do it this way with their fresh revelation, they have to have another fresh revelation next week and another fresh revelation after that. They have to keep up the act or the followers will scatter. Friend, it's a form of slavery. It's a, friend of, it's a form of manipulation. And it's trying to get your eyes off of this book. But there's another side to that. You can go all the way to one side into the ditch, or you can go all the way to the other side into the ditch, and that's where you have the learned interpreters. And they are people who are, have such vast experience. They have such vast training, such a, an incredible ability to expound God's word that they're just on a plane above you. 
They're so high in the clouds above you that they are indispensable. That If I have a question, I just go to them. And after a while, we stop realizing that we can just go to God with his word, and he will explain it to us, and instead, we look to them. It's another form of domination. It was especially true in Peter's day with those people who we call Judaizers. They were experts in the background of the Old Testament. And a Judaizer, a Jew, could actually say, look, I grew up with this. You've been a Christian three months. I can teach it to you if you just sit there and hush and let me. And sometimes that leads to this situation where I've become such a learned interpreter that it's another form of manipulation. It's another form of slavery. So we hear the timely warning about these false prophets. So how do we counter it? How do we defend ourselves against this contaminated culture? And it's not just out there. I'm talking about in the church as well. You counter it in exactly the same way that we do today. Exactly the same way they did by going right back to the indestructible, unchanging truth of the Word of God. And if any teaching, I don't care how popular their name, if any book, I don't care how many millions of copies it's sold, if any song, doctrine, TV, preacher, etc. contradicts this book, you take this book over them every time. And I'm talking about even if it's me. Well, <laughs> especially if it's me. This book is first. And if you start to hear me preaching something that doesn't come from this book, you call me on it. I expect it. And I ask you, I, I, in fact, I, I encourage it. If anything does that, if it denies or contradicts. Now listen, I can still love those people. I can still enjoy their singing sometimes. But I'm going to hate that sin because it's coming, coming from that contaminated culture. And I would not bring a big glob of mud in here and smack it down on this table this morning. How many of you know that would be disrespectful? That would be horrible. Why then would we allow that in our hearts from the contamination in our culture or the contamination even in church culture to say that somehow now I have, you know, I can bring in a little bit of contamination. How much poison do you want in your water? Is one part per million, is that, is that small enough amount of poison that it's okay? I don't want any, okay? I just soon not have any. And we're going to look next week at a trio of witnesses that are going to definitely bring this to, 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 a, uh, to, to a point. So we'll see how incredibly pointed this is. But let me just tell you what his point is with the contaminated culture. Skip down to verse number 9. Verse number 9 is going to explain to us what this is all about. And I'll, pre I'll, I'll mention this and then we'll go to the Lord's Supper. Verse number 9. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. What's going to happen with this contaminated culture? What's going to happen if we allow that contamination into us, into us as a church, into us as a nation? Well, verse 9 tells us that the sin will be punished and that the righteous will be delivered. God knows how to punish the sin and God knows how to deliver his own. When you are attacked, when you are, uh, it just seems like you're about to lose. When, when it just seems like the world is coming undone at the seams. Remember that God knows how to punish the sin. And God knows how to deliver the righteous. Scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, It is appointed unto men once to die, after this, the judgment. Friend, judgment is coming. That payday, that day when sin's bill comes due, it is coming. And if you think you're going to get a pass, forget about it. He uses three witnesses there, angels, the ancient world, and even Sodom and Gomorrah he uses as witnesses to say, God knew how to punish that sin. He held them accountable, and he did not let them go. And so this week, I'm looking for a way of escape. <laughs> I know that I have no righteousness in myself. I'm a sinner. What do I do about it? I look for that way of escape. If God knows how to punish the sin, I'm in trouble because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But now if... If God loves me, he's going to rescue me out of that sin. Well, he did. He sent his own precious dear son to the cross to, 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 to see his body broken and his blood shed 
that we might be rescued, that we might be snatched away from that judgment that is to come. And if you're here this morning, and you've never cried out to Jesus, never asked Him to forgive you for your sin, never asked Him to to come into your heart, be your Lord and your Savior. Friend, today can be your day. Because I'm here to tell you that the wages of sin is still death. But Jesus went to the cross and suffered that death in your place for you and for me. And so as we approach this table here in just a moment, my first question to you is, are you a born-again, Christ-honoring child of the living God? And what I mean by that is if you were to pass away from this life today, and I mean you closed your eyes in death on the way home from church this afternoon, do you know in your heart, beyond the shadow of any doubt, that you would open your eyes in the presence of your Savior? Because the Bible tells us he wants you to be sure. These things have I written to those who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you might know that you have eternal life in 1 John 5, 13. He wants you to know it. You can know it. And this morning, if you're 100% sure of that, thank him for it. And celebrate this table knowing that it was his gift to you on the cross that made it possible. But maybe you're here this morning and you would say, Brother, I have let some of that contamination into my heart. Some of that false teaching, some of the world's ways, some of the sin of this world, which we're going to talk about next week in in much greater detail. Some of us have come to this table this morning knowing I'm probably not ready to partake because I'm still mad at old so-and-so at work, or I'm still angry with my wife, or I'm still upset with my husband, and I'm going to give us just a couple of moments here before we go to the table. If you need to say, God, here I am, Wash me again. Lord, I have, I have allowed that culture of contamination to, to so change me that I'm just not ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper. I'm not ready to remember again the purity of the sacrifice without a fresh washing and a fresh cleansing. He'll give you that today. Maybe you need to make that pew in which you sit this morning, an altar, to say, Lord, come and just clean my hands once again. Maybe you're at that place where you say, I'm just not ready to do that. I'm so mad. I'm so upset. I could just chew nails and spit BBs. If that's you, maybe you need to let the Lord's Supper pass you by until you've had a chance to get with God and ask Him to forgive you.